Hello and welcome to the very first Bony Broad Review and I'm delighted to be joining forces once again with a wonderful Charlotte White and we've read a book which we've both finished but we don't know what each other thinks about it. So Charlie, hello, it's been ages, how have you been? I've been really good, it's been far too long Bony, are you well? I'm very well, I'm, <laughs> I'm mildly hungover but that's due to weddings but there we go. That, yeah. It's not a wedding if you don't leave slightly hungover. No, and I don't think you should ever attempt to record any content for the internet unless you are either hungover or drunk. Well, we, we've done quite <laughs> well out of it in the past. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but we're, come on, be professional. Right. So what book have we read? We have read the new book from Robert Harris, which I noticed my camera is back to front. So you guys are just going to have to figure that out for yourself. It's my Robert Harris and it's Act of Oblivion. So one of the reasons I was keen to read this one with you <laughs> uh -huh. is because this is sort of your wheelhouse. This oh, is... yes. Yes, this is, ladies and gentlemen, if you need to find Charlie on the internet, she is Restoration Cake. So we're right in the middle of the restoration here. So let's um, <laughs> let's have some fun here. The quick pre see for the book is Charles II has returned. Yes. There was the very famous, if you turn yourselves in, all those nasty people who signed the death warrant for my father will be lenient. Mm hmm didn't quite go for that. And then everything starts going from there. Um, who do, who do, what does, what does Robert do in this book? Cause I'm, I'm just going to go out and say to start with here, I'm a big Robert Harris fan. Uh, all, all his books are literally on the other bookshelf over there. <laughs> so I, I'm, 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 I'm keen. I'm keen to hear what you thought, but who do, who, who are the main characters in this? Who are the hunters and who are the huntees? Okay, so what we've got is just a backtrack here. We need we need to go back a bit. So the act of indemnity. I, I, I thought you might. <laughs> of course, you know I can't resist it. The act of indemnity and oblivion is 1660. Charles II has come back. He's been invited back by Parliament after being in exile for what, 11 years? Well, it's 11 years since the execution of Charles I. So give or take a small battle in Worcester um, and some time in Scotland. He's been away for, for that long. As part of the agreement of him coming back, he is going to need to deal with a few people. And without wishing to start up a whole civil war again, which is what you do if you march back in and say, right, you, you were on the wrong side, guys, all of you, out of your properties, and you're going to lose your heads. What he does is he says there's going to be this act of indemnity and oblivion for everyone who was on the wrong side. They've got two weeks. Come back, bend the knee, kiss the hand, do all of that. If you're loyal, you know, that's it's fine. And he gives a lot of top jobs in his administration to people who were on the wrong side, like the Earl of Manchester, who, who was pretty much in charge at Marston Moor, becomes in charge of Charles's household, he becomes Lord Chamberlain. So they do get good jobs. The only people who are accepted from this is anybody who wrote their name on the King's death warrant. Fair. We, we call with that. Mm -hmm. That's his dad. That yeah, makes, makes, makes sense. Yeah. You, <laughs> you, you literally put your name to you know, kill him a dad. So we're, we're coming for you. So those people, there's no, you can't say sorry from that point on. We've got your name. You wrote it you're in trouble. And if if you're dead, that's also really not an excuse. So Oliver Cromwell, Henry Ireton <laughs> and John Bradshaw are all exhumed from Westminster Abbey and hung up on display. And everybody else who's alive runs. They leg it. Um, some of them go to uh, Holland. Get A lot of them go to Holland. And some of them go out to the New World. They go out to Massachusetts, America, wherever you, where they can get to. Um, these guys, it's not Massachusetts, is it? It is Massachusetts. It is Massachusetts. Massachusetts. Yeah, you know, I just had a, yeah, I had a moment. I really yeah. doubted myself there. Um, so we are dealing with two in particular here. We're dealing with Wally and Goff. So they are two colonels and... 
they are related by marriage. So uh, Wally is the father-in-law of Goff. Goff married Wally's daughter. Um, and they they run, they get out of the country. And a, a crack force is uh, sent in to deal with them. A guy by the name of James so Naylor. Yes, and Mr. Naylor is a creation of, of, of Mr. Harris, but there was, there was bound to be somebody like him, I think, mm. is, is probably there, that, you know, there, or multiple ones traveling, because you know, they're, they're off into, as you said, Holland and Germany and places like that to, to literally drag these folks back. Yeah. So one thing I want to ask before we dive into the book, two weeks isn't a lot of time <laughs> in old, olden times when you know, you're... you're your foot power and horsepower were most were most of the people already in London or the surroundings when Charles returned because you you sort of think today you give someone two weeks you can get just about anywhere to or from yeah but it's yeah. I mean they were gone it will take a long time to get the word out yeah they're gone before he's before he's back I mean the writing's on the wall mm. from um from early in the year pretty much the moment that General Monk declares that he's not going to let the army do whatever they want. Um, at the beginning of 1660, it becomes very clear that things are going to change and they're going to change quickly. The first new elections in, you know, in, in many years, I don't know how many years it was, but the first new elections were held in April 1660. So they would have known at that point when that parliament comes and sits that that things are different. And uh, they begin negotiations with the king in exile from that point. So anybody with with a head on their shoulders <laughs> for the time being um, will have will have started getting out way before that. There were some who thought that they could get away with still being in the country, and eleven regicides were killed across ten days in some horrific, just mass trials and mass traitors' deaths, which you know, is the hanging, drawing, quartering, not particularly nice. And uh, it only really stopped officially when the residents of Charing Cross complained about the smell. So, uh, mm. a bit grisly. But those, nim you know, in terms... Nimbies. Sorry. Nimbies. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, it's just one thing after another, isn't it, when you're a homeowner? It's hanging people out the front of the house. Um, you know, in terms of the the creation of Robert Naylor and him being a, a fictional character, a lot of this was was done by spy work and spy networks and was fairly under cover to, to sort of flush these people out of the communities where they were hiding. So it, it makes perfect sense that we don't have names and exact people who were who were hunting the regicides. It's the most famous potential hunter that we've got is Afra Bain, who may have um, done a little bit of regicide hunting in um, in Holland. But, uh, so she was cool. Yeah, very cool, yeah. <laughs> but she doesn't make an appearance in no, this book. No, we don't get her. Um, so we, we, we've, we've got Mr. Naylor, and it's, you know, what... what, what he says quickly looking you know, but witness the greatest manhunt of the 17th century and to be fair you know Mailer racks up the um the sea miles doesn't he so he he chases wally and Goff across to to boston and, and beyond and i think um just delving into the the sort of the emotive side of the book i think what's interesting is that that puritan world in america mm. in those in that that part of time as well and the the fierce networks that they'd already built up and the the sort of the simmering divides between you know re republican and uh, monarchy that was still that was still going there but the thing i didn't realize until i read this book was how many indentured servants of captured soldiers had been shipped across yeah and you know that nail is then able to gather these essentially slaves together to help him fight down you know, these two rather well-known colonels. They were cavalry colonels, weren't they? Yeah. So um, it's why there are it's, so uh, many, that, that... there are so many Scottish in America because they were during the civil war and after Dunbar as well, um, at the, at the sort of tail end of the, what we call the, the third civil war, because 
the joke about the English Civil War is it wasn't all fought in England, it wasn't civil and it wasn't just one war. Um, so you know, it's, it's more complicated than that. But yeah, loads and loads of Scots were just sent out there to work on building the new world, you know, because obviously there was nothing there. Um, and then Westerners turned up and and built this this whole new world. But it's interesting you say that because I think this book gives a very good flavour of that early period of American history as well. You can see why these people would then want to rise up against their king with, you know, 100 years later. The seeds of it are there. And it's, you know, we, we, we won't delve into the, the joys of middle Christianity because that, that will, yeah, will be here forever. But those, what's interesting as well is the, the divides upon divides that, are, that are, you know, you can still see within America as, as it's built up the, the sort of arch conservatives versus, you know, the, the, the more, what we would now term left leaning of, of those Puritan mm-hmm. groups as well, depending about where they were. And you see, you know, settlements that we know quite well pop up in the book as little towns that are now you know, massive cities. And all of these routes would come from uh, people trying to force force their way into the wilderness so that they could be closer to God and have a, a community not tainted by you know, what was going on back in, in the old world and, and the king and prince of Wales who were naughty boys. I mean, look, let's, let's face it. If, you, um, if you're a Puritan. America as we know it is a very, very young country. It's a, I remember being in New York and a, a, a yellow cab driver very proudly telling me that this park is over 200 years old. I'm thinking the Queen's got handbags older than that. <laughs> <You know>? um, <laughs> so it is, it is uh, these things that happen in the 17th century are they're relevant here. They're even more super relevant when you're looking at America because those, like you say, those little divides and those, it all comes through their history. And it's, uh, I think Robert Harris does a great job of of bringing that to life in a really good way and introducing people to, I, I, to I, the 17th century. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I, it's it's the, the use of the letters as well and how they, they sort of go to and for people because it's, yeah. It's hard or to get your head round. Written letters and pen pals. Sorry, it's it's hard it, to it is yeah, now. instant yeah. instant communication. My phone's here buzz, buzzing away with 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 stuff like that. But you know, having sending a letter that would take months to reach its destination if it did at all, um, and then you've got you know the postmaster general whose main job it is is to not actually deliver the post but to read other people's mail. You know, yeah. it's yeah. So it's, anyways, right. So let's get let's get down to this. Um, we like the setting. We think the, the the drawing of America is is good. As someone who lives, writes, yeah. spends far too much time in this period, <laughs> did it work? Did it work? I found that there was, for me, there was one glaring point of view missing, and that was the king. He he does not feature in this at all. Charles II is is barely a footnote in this story and I know why he's done it I get it I get why he's done it because of course everybody everybody knows Charles everybody loves him as the king of bling from the horrible histories which is pretty spot on I'll be honest with you so leaving him out I get why he's done it so that he can focus on other people but with this issue it's his dad that we're going after here and it's this tightrope that he's trying to walk of, you cannot kill everybody who was against you. That It does not work like that. I mean, he has the ultimate healing and settling job in front of him. I mean, you think that, that the country is divided at the moment. You, know, you have an awkward Christmas, maybe, with the you know, family members who are still arguing over Brexit. This was a civil war. This was families fighting families within families and killing each other you've now got to get everybody moving in the same direction but they killed his dad and that has to be answered for so i find 
him, his, the absence of his voice is quite glaring. Though I'm thrilled that people are now meeting Edward Hyde, the Earl of Clarendon. So, yay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I thought that was interesting because you know he he makes that decision to you know rent justice upon fifty as 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 that sort of mediating thing and as you said bringing uh, bringing these people in, into the court again to to, to run the country which yeah. masterstroke really um, but I, I think I I totally agree with you there that it's it sort of seems to be Naylor's crusade yes um, and you know others are telling him throughout, you know, you can, you can, you can stop now, you can stop now, but there's, you know, he wouldn't be, yes, he's been given a very personal reason to do it, which we won't spoil in, in, in that. And he's got a reason to go after Wally and Goff. Um, but you are quite right. There's that, that precedence, his, his command authority is kind of missing mm -hmm. in it. It's, it, it, it seems a, more of a, a vendetta than anything else. Yeah. And even one scene, you know, with, with him, talking to Hyde would have would have just made me made me so happy but of course he just exists in the background kind of flouncing around and um hanging around with Barbara Villiers which of course he was but he, he did get stuff done as well the man woke up at five o'clock in the morning so that he could get stuff done delegate to ministers and then spend time with his mistress <laughs> It's hard, hard, it's hard. It's hard to be the king, but it's, it's good a multitasker. To be the king. <laughs> so I, 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 I saw this very much in the same sort of vein as an officer, officer and a spy, where you, if you know the history, you kind of already know the ending. So, mm -hmm. Officer and a Spy was Harris's book about the the Dreyfus affair, um, which he, you know, and and that's I think that's Harris's skill is he can take something you know and still make you wonder what's going to happen mm -hmm. in, at at the end. Um, and if you, you know, if you've, you know, looked into this, but you kind of will know what happens at the end. But I think as a straight up thriller, it it is, it is thrilling. But also I think where it's best is, as we were saying, is the colors that it paints for the new world mm -hmm. and what was going on in, in America that sort of still seeps, seeps through to today. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the little snippets in Holland, I would have liked to have seen more of more of what was going on in Holland because Holland was, you know, open season, wasn't it? There was there was spies and hunters and you know, yeah, an, an amazing amazing place to put to 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 set something, but it's not here. Yeah. But no, there we go. <laughs> it's um, it's it's interesting what he does and what only a historical novel can do, as opposed to a straight history of the time, is it can take you from one point of view to another point of view and not have to not have to deal with the shades of gray in the middle so from chapter to chapter we go from um from Naylor the hunter's point of view to Wally and Goff's point of view as they are trying to run from him and so from chapter to chapter you're being told that they killed the king this is a mortal sin that they must be punished for a natural act against god to he was a tyrant and we did what was necessary and we were making the country more godly and now it's gone back. You can't get that from straight history because you can only sort of, you, you have to see everything all at once in that. This is great because you can read it and just go, yeah, oh, you, no, you, you're right. <laughs> kind of, you can, you can really experience both sides of that very passionate, very emotive point of view that they they all believed so strongly in it's not sort of a it wasn't a hobby it wasn't a the way that people lived in those days they were fiercely religious in a way that perhaps we're not very much today and they all believed that they were right and that god was with them <laughs> that's I, I loved it for that reason fantastic i i thoroughly enjoyed it as well it, it it's he has such a wonderful way of, like you said, paint, painting with many, many colours, and especially with his characters as well. Mm -hmm. And I think the the conflicts within the different Puritan colonies, as well as Wally and Goff worked their way through them, um, is is interesting. You know, there's if you know the story, you know the story. But there's there's one scene of um, 
you know the Native Americans is yeah. You know, like an obligatory attack it's a recorded historical event i think that's maybe where he lets the side down a little bit is they are very much central casting indians yeah um i, I thought as, as as someone who's you know metty in first nations in, in the blood you sort of pick out these sorts of things and i think that was a missed opportunity considering how much time wally and goff spent in the wilderness and um, things that that could have been a little bit more well-rounded but really we're just being picky or i'm just being picky here because it's yeah i mean if, if you, you know, want to, i think it works a, a, a lot better than his last than his last book which, if you want to be picky yeah. though you could also say the same for um for the women they're very much central casting yes. wives and daughters um and i could have frankly done without them a little bit because they didn't really add anything he he didn't write them roundly enough for them to be you know, to be cared about too much and it would have been fine it's, you know it's it's okay just say the wife's at home it's fine i'm okay with that <laughs> yeah and it, yeah i suppose that bit when that thing happens when they all get to america again trying to talk around the spoilers it, it, it's a bit it is a bit forced you're right but i think Follow, following the th sort of three main characters mm -hmm. as they as they work their way um, through their journey, yeah, I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And it's interesting. It's, I, mean, well. I think it's a return to form. It, okay, well, I mean, this is the, this is where I'm sort of at a slight loss to you because I haven't read any other Robert Harris books. I've seen Munich on Netflix, which I loved, and I think I might have seen other things. Get read 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 the cicero trilogy it's incredible okay and it, when the rsc revived the play as well see the play okay i'll see the play remarkable. i'll see the play it's quicker more yeah, efficient tech <laughs> I, I, I think i think it's actually on the um the rsc player thing um, ah. sorry, okay now that i'll check we, out we'd have a, because yeah. his last book was in my wheelhouse it was about v2s and and things like that in the second world war see. and it <laughs> and, I, and i and very the, yeah the publisher very kindly sent us our, our copies we which is very nice of them um so we we don't want to be too hard on them but no that last book wasn't good this one though is is great so i loved would it we recommend it Charlie? yeah i definitely yeah. recommend it um he he does a very good job as well of um dealing with some very complex political and moral wranglings that were going on within within the sort of parliamentarian side of the civil war because it wasn't as straightforward as you know that there was one side versus another side because that would have that would have meant that we probably would still be a republic to this day what happened after oliver cromwell died is the republic ate itself because you had um, the army who wanted um the kind of good old cause that they'd fought for of you know, godliness and righteousness and everything and then there's other sides who are a little bit more okay no we need to have a this stable form of government that we understand and it all starts kind of fighting against each other and when you've got an army involved you end up in trouble so we actually have wally and goff almost embodying the two sides of the argument that broke the whole thing apart you know goff as a younger man is much more radical <clears throat> he's much more religious um he's yeah very um uh, what we call an extremist i think and mm -hmm. whereas wally is older he's more pragmatic and it's brilliant how they they buff up against each other and they've got that added sort of um lovely dynamic of being family by marriage as well which is is just a really really great device for that but what i'd want to ask you is having read this and having dipped a toe in this would you then go and read a book about the hunting of the regicides in real life i i think i think i would i think there's this is such a small sliver of 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 what that hunt would actually was and you know like like we we're saying before the bits i have dipped into about holland it's you know yeah that's almost le carre ish isn't it mm. it's yeah it's 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 mad. Um, so yes, I definitely would. I would also love to spend more time, um, you know, with a sort of female centric 
historical novel sets during the restoration which you know i've been waiting for for a long time and, you know, i'm just not allowed i'm not allowed to read You're not it. allowed to I, I will i will let you read it so um to link it in to what we're saying there's a there's a suggestion made in this book and i'm going to refute it strongly that charles takes wally's house on king street and gives it to barbara villiers ah did not happen so when when wally was <laughs> on when wally realized you know the shit is about to hit the fan sorry um i don't know if i'm allowed to swear on youtube um we're good when when wally realizes the game is up he sells his house very quickly for whatever ready cash he can get and he sells it to one roger palmer who is barbara's husband and he needs a place closer to um, to Whitehall so that he can go to his new job as an MP. So it was purchased fair and square. <laughs> it was not taken and given. He bought it for her. Her husband bought it for her, which is very sweet of him. Um, <laughs> so, no, it would be wonderful to see more things written about um, about women at this time because they are fascinating creatures. But if you want a book about the hunting of the regicides, Charles Spencer's Killers of the King is brilliant. He's a phenomenal writer and uh, he brings that to life very, very well. Fantastic. So there we go. Ladies and gentlemen, you have two book recommendations <laughs> there. Of course, both both links will be there for the bookshop down below. Charlie, it is always a pleasure to oh, spend time with you, you chatting about anything. So thank, thank you for, you for having today. me. Thank you for letting me rant about 17th century. Yeah. Yay. Well, to be fair, I think maybe we need to get you and Michelle and do one on Blonde. But I, It's still too fresh. Yeah, it's still yeah. too fresh. <laughs> <laughs> So thank you so much. Until next time, we're going to do more of these with more guests. Some of them are just going to be me on my own, so you can skip those. Um, and we'll, we'll be back with some more reviews soon. Thanks so much. 